All right, we are on. What is the purpose of this video? Um, another rejoinder, you could say, to my previous video about um, why I'm not Eastern Orthodox, and in particular as it pertains to Pseudo Dionysius. Pseudo Dionysius, the Arapagite, supposed companion of Paul, uh, whose writings from the 6th century influenced Eastern Christianity and Western Christianity tremendously. Um, <clears throat> there has been some criticism that I received, uh, mainly in my assessment of Pseudo Dionysius, that he was not in fact the origin of the Neoplatonism in the East, and because many of the features and facets of his teaching can be found prior to his arrival via his writings in the 6th century, that I am wrong, that uh, it was not Pseudo Dionysius that corrupted the East, and that I should retract these statements. Well, you know, I hold some credentials, but I do not hold credentials from a Bible college or from any sort of theological university, but I've done a fair amount of reading. Um, if you would stack my reading up against, so, you know, quite a few people with advanced degrees, you might find that I've actually done more reading, um, or at least I've done reading commensurate with having an advanced degree. All that reading through the years has served to make me fairly well-rounded, but I would not then, I would not rest on that alone. I would, I would point to the authorities as they speak, and I'll, I'll just quote this authority out of this book. Uh, Handbook to the History of Christianity by Eerdmans. This has, it's like an encyclopedia. It has articles written by scholars, people with actual degrees. So I will defer to them. Uh, but I hope that my detractors will also defer to them. And so the article that I'm reading, you can look this up. This book exists. You can get this on eBay for like 10 bucks. You can read this article. This article appears on page 242. It's titled Pseudo Dionysius the Aropagite. It is by David F. Wright. And we're going to see what David F. Wright has to say about Pseudo Dionysius and his effect long term on the Eastern Orthodox Church. All right, I might pause at various points. To, uh, to discuss what uh, this, this uh, David Wright is saying. Uh, certainly by the end, I'll have uh, a summation to demonstrate that I, I have been right, that Pseudo Dionysius is a major, perhaps the main corrupting feature factor of the Eastern Orthodox Church. All right, let's begin. The name of Dionysius, Paul's convert in Athens, was borrowed by the unidentified Early 6th century Syrian who wrote the Divine Names, Mystical Theology, the Celestial Hierarchy, the Ecclesiastical Hierarchy, and some letters. Although Monophysite Christians were the first to refer to them, they were soon accepted as authentic by the Chalcedonians such as Leonidas of, I'm sorry, Leontius of Byzantium, Maximus the Confessor's paraphrases, finally established their authority in the East, while in the West, Gregory the Great and the Lateran Council of 649 accepted them as first century writings. So let's pause there. Uh, right off the bat, we're, we're admitting that these are not by anyone named Dionysius, at least not the Dionysius that we're thinking of. It is not Paul's convert from the first century. It is some unknown Syrian who is writing using a borrowed name. We call this pseudepigrapha. We could also call it a forgery. Um, it took a while to be accepted, partly because it was first used by the Monophysites, and those Monophysites were regarded as heretics. Uh, they believed that Christ had a single nature that was a combination of both human and divine. They uh, confused the substances, so to speak. So uh, that didn't give it uh, much credibility initially, but then certain major figures, uh, for instance, Maximus uh, the Confessor, and then, and then the, uh, the 649 Lateran Council under Gregory the Great, caused these things to be accepted as legitimate, authentic writings in the century which followed. All right, moving on. 
Pseudo-Dionysius writings depend closely on the Neoplatonist uh, Plotinus and Proclus, uh, who died in the 5th century. He views the universe as a hierarchy with the heavenly pattern reflected in the church, the triads of angels, uh, choirs which mediate between God and men, correspond to the triads of sacraments, orders of clergy, and classes of inferior Christians. Moreover, three stages of spiritual life, purification, illumination, and union lead to the goal of becoming like God himself. The ascent through these stages can consist of advances in the unknowing by shedding sensible and rational perceptions. Illumination is by a ray of divine darkness. This mysticism of darkness has secular Greek roots, identifying spirit with pure intelligence rather than using biblical concepts. So, that's a lot there. First of all, notice that he's not relying on scripture, but he's relying heavily on Plotinus and Proclus, both Neoplatonists of the preceding century. Uh, they view the universe in a hierarchy, and another word for hierarchy, or another, another word you might use to conceptualize hierarchy is emanationism, so that as things progress from God, there's this stair-step pattern moving down to, uh, to the realm of man, to the physical. And so that Mary, as a conduit within that chain, has to be then uh, semi-divine if she's to give birth to uh, the divine Christ. So that, that's one reason that Mary is held in the regard that she is. It's because the emanationism, this, uh, this hierarchalism coming from Pseudo-Dionysius pretty much demands it. All right, so three stages of spiritual life, purification, illumination, and union. That's basically the, uh, it's, it's, it's luminism, the idea that you, the individual, will become enlightened from within, and in so doing, you come closer and closer to God. And so the result is that uh, you don't really need Christ. You can simply achieve this by means of self, self um, you could say, uh, deprivation, depriving oneself of earthly goods, depriving oneself of the desires of the passions, much like the Platonists and the Stoics did before, even before Christianity. Through that and then meditation, you can achieve unity with the monad. Well, none of that is Christian. Uh, the, the need for Christ as a mediator is gone. Uh, let's proceed. Um, ascent through these stages consists in advances of unknowing by shedding sensible and rational perceptions. So apophatic theology, the idea that you can't say anything about God, you can only tell what you don't know about God, that also comes now from Pseudo-Dionysius. Apophatic theology is the inability to say anything positively true about God, which is not what the apostles followed, because in, in 1 John, in 1 John he says, uh, God is love. Um, Paul says in Hebrews that our God is a consuming fire. So they're willing to say positive statements concerning God. They don't have to always say, uh, we see through a glass darkly. They do use that language sometimes, but God is not nearly the mystery to the apostles as he is to a man like Pseudo-Dionysius. All right, moving on. It says, uh, uh, This mysticism of darkness has secular Greek roots, identifying spirit with pure intelligence rather than using biblical concepts. And so, there again, in Pseudo-Dionysius, uh, he uses Greek secular thought, Greek philosophic thought, Platonist thought, but does not use biblical concepts. These are uh, dispensed with. These are dispensed with so that the philosophy of Plato can come can come through and take effect, take take root within Christianity, and then where Christianity is something of a mask. And uh, the last paragraph, last paragraph states. This, synth this synthesis of Christian and Neoplatonic concepts enormously influences Byzantine theologies of mysticism and liturgy and Western mystics, scholastics and Renaissance, Platonist thinkers, Dionysius works were translated into Latin by Eurogena about 850. Lorenzo Valla first questioned their authenticity in the 15th century. This was widely doubted in the Reformation era, although not disproved until the end of the 19th century. So, this synthesis, that is 
the Dionysian system enormously influenced. That's the words that are used. That's the words that are used. Let's see. Enormously influenced. Byzantine theologies of mysticism and liturgy. And Western mystics, scholastics, and Renaissance Platonist thinkers. So, when you say enormously influenced, uh, that's, that's significant. How many other things could possibly enormously influence the tradition? Uh, probably not few. You know, if you were to speak of enormous influences, you'd probably count them on one hand. Uh, certainly, Dionysius takes the forefront. He's uh, center stage. If, if the things he says can override the things that Paul says, you know, if the things that he says can override the Gospels, um, then he is front and center. Now, when you ask the Eastern Orthodox about this, they won't give you a straight answer. And I know because I've asked them. Say, well, tell me about the significance of Pseudo Dionysius on your tradition. And they claim that he's not important at all. And I say, well, what about the fact that he's honored in your liturgy, but he's fake? And they're like, well, prove he's fake. Well, I mean, look, how do you prove anything? All right? Everyone that reads him says that he's reliant upon people that should not have even been alive at the time of the real Dionysius. So I've heard the strangest theories to try to prop this up. But honestly, if you're going to throw out things like the donation of Constantine and the, the, the pseudo Isidorian uh, decretals and uh, other, other various forgeries of the past, if you're going to throw these out, then on the same grounds, you can throw out pseudo Dionysius. And you really have to if you're going to be intellectually honest. Uh, so the other, the other crit crit criticism that I've heard, because I've quoted this to other people, and they're like, well, well, was David F. Wright orthodox? You know, as though one had to be orthodox to know any of this. And if one is orthodox, obviously you've ignored this evidence anyway. So what does the evidence say? What, is, what do the scholars say? What do people who hold, you know, more advanced degrees than I hold, what do they say? They say that Pseudo Dionysius was a false saint. He relied upon secular thought from Neoplatonic philosophers that he ignored scripture, that he built things like this, this hierarchy of ascendancy to God apart from Christ. He developed things like ap apophatic theology that uh, doesn't permit one to say anything positively true about God, can't posit, can't posit absolute true statements about God. Um, he is responsible for the, the uh overabundant veneration of Mary because of that hierarchical system, that emanationism. And so when I critique that whole system based on the influence of this man, and somebody says, well, he's irrelevant, I say, no, look, the scholars say that this tradition is enormously influenced by Pseudo-Dionysius. Um, that should be enough to settle the argument. And if you, if you study uh, Eastern Orthodoxy long enough, you realize that this is absolutely true. That whatever, whatever elements of Neoplatonism had come before, they really become codified and then they, they're made permanent uh, by the writings of Pseudo-Dionysius. So that should be enough to settle the argument. Now, that's not going to be enough to shut up any of the ortho bros. They will go insane. They'll go deeper and deeper into their insanity. Um, I'll post this and see, see what kind of bites it gets. Um, I really don't. Ha I, ho I hope to not have to post any more to demonstrate this point. I am going to post five reasons why I am Roman Catholic, probably with a rejoinder explaining why um, those reasons are probably also invalid. Meaning, many of the reasons I became Catholic, I have discovered only later that uh, these were misrepresented to me. So, where does that leave us? Where does that leave Catholics? Where does that leave Orthodox? Um, really in a position where no matter which tradition you choose, you're going to have to deal with a lot of nonsense. You have to deal with a lot of falsehood. And maybe the only place where you have the freedom to truly deal with these falsehoods is in Protestantism. As strange as that sounds. Um, maybe the Protestants have... Maybe they have a bead on the fact that you do need a certain amount of latitude, a certain amount of 
leash to deal with these things intellectually, uh, to do it honestly. And you simply cannot find that level of intellectual honesty within either side, east or west, of Catholicism. Uh, so that's where I'm at right now. Uh, be sure to like, subscribe, argue with me in the comments. Talk to you all later.